Humor is supposed to be the domain of the original. The subversive. Of course I'm not gonna take my shirt off on my special. And the unexpected. Well, I didn't expect a kind of Spanish Inquisition. <laughs> Nobody expects the Spanish Inquisition. And that should include sitcoms, right? <laughs> well, kind of. Although the individual jokes, characters, and moments of sitcoms can be unique and surprising. I'll do the funny walk. <laughs> the general plot structure of sitcoms is almost always the same. Here's a story of a lovely lady. All sitcoms, even the riskiest, most cutting edge ones, follow some variation of this simple structure. It's so predictable that once you've learned it, you could tune into a sitcom at a random moment and make a pretty good guess at how far into the episode you are and what's going to happen next. So what's the structure? Let's take a look at episodes from four very different sitcoms, each mold-breaking in its own way, and expose what they all have in common. In the first one to four minutes, we have an introductory scene. Here we find out what the main protagonist or protagonists of the episode want. Usually they have an underlying want and a specific goal that's based in that want. Morty wants Jessica to like him. Here we go. He hey, Jessica! And specifically, he wants her to go to the school's flu awareness dance with him. Michael wants his son, George Michael, to be happy and successful. The next four years are all about your future, and that's the most important thing to me, okay? And he thinks getting his son into the Milford school will do that. Jerry, George, and Elaine just want to get a table. Where is someone? I'm starving. This is him right here. Oh, uh, is there a table ready? And Lucy and Ethel want their husband's respect. Listen, holding down a job is a lot more difficult than lying around the house all day long. Why? 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 Is that all you think we do? Notice that this moment both establishes what Lucy wants and what she thinks is keeping her from having what she wants. Her husband's belief that she's lazy and incompetent. Sitcoms will introduce the protagonist's main obstacle as soon as they introduce their main want, usually within the same scene or up to three or so minutes later. Morty is not in Jessica's league. Do stay in your league. The Milford School doesn't want to associate itself with the Bluth family's scandals. I think this bad press is starting to taint my son's future and we've got to put an end to it. There's a wait at the restaurant. I'll be five, ten minutes. Usually within the next two minutes, we find out how the protagonist is going to address the main obstacle. Could you make some sort of chemical thing happen inside of Jessica's mind? You know, so where she falls in love with me and all that sort of thing? I met a publicist today. I'm gonna hire her. We need somebody to make us look good. What do you want to do? Let's go someplace else. I am too hungry. We might as well just stay here. We haven't got that much time if we're gonna make the movie. We'll change places. We'll get jobs and you take care of the house for a week, okay? Now, we're an average of five minutes into the episode. We've introduced the protagonist's main want, the obstacle standing between them and what they want, and their plan to overcome that obstacle. It's time for the middle section of the sitcom, where we see the protagonist put the plan that they stated into motion, run into a minor obstacle that thwarts or complicates their plan, and then come up with a new plan. Lather, rinse, repeat. First, the original plan. Morty uses the potion, and it seems to work. I love you, Morty. The publicist starts working with the Bluth family. You're going to start doing some charity work with your magic. Actually, I'm kind of the charity one of the family. I think it's best if you got a job. And Tobias, you're a medical doctor and you're living an absurd fantasy as an actor. It's time to get real. Jerry, Elaine, and George start waiting. Jerry, get menus so when we sit down we'll be able to order right away. Can't look at a menu now. I gotta be at the table. Lucy and Ethel go to an employment agency. Who's next? We are. Uh... We're together. Now it's time to run into the first sub-obstacle that throws off the plan. The potion spreads with Jessica's flu, and soon everybody falls in love with Morty. Let me go! I love you, Morty! <laughs> Michael is worried that his son won't be able to handle seeing his dad going out with the publicist. This uh, might be moving a little bit too fast for him. I mean, for, for us. Me. Me. Elaine notices that the restaurant doesn't seat people predictably. Didn't those people just come in? I, I believe we were ahead of them. Lucy and Ethel clearly have no prior job experience. What job did you have in mind? Uh, what kind of jobs do you have open? Oh, well, what do you do? What kind of jobs do you have open? Well, what do you do? 
What kind of jobs do you have open? Now, the protagonists will take an action to address this new sub-obstacle. Each obstacle should set up the protagonist to display their signature character trait, the thing that's funny to watch them do over and over and makes them who they are as a sitcom character. It's often a character flaw as well as something that endears us to them. Characters may have more than one, but usually there's a dominant trait. Rick wields his scientific genius irresponsibly, without regard for collateral damage or humanity in general. Here's his plan to fix the first sub-problem. It's gonna be fine, Morty, relax. I whipped up an antidote. This directly results in a second obstacle. Okay, well, sometimes science has more art than science, Morty. Which he addresses with the same stubborn character flaw. This right here is gonna do the trick, baby. In Seinfeld, the protagonists are relentlessly preoccupied with the minutia of everyday life. I, I believe we were having of them. Yeah. What's your name? Seinfeld? <laughs> no, no, they were here before. To the point where life starts getting absurd right back at them. Want a, want a table? No. Oh. Just bring me a plate and I'll eat here. <laughs> Come on, I'll give you a table. <laughs> where am I? <laughs> Dream? Michael thinks he puts his son's happiness before everything, but he's not actually in tune with his son, and is really just using him as an excuse not to take any risks and maintain the status quo of his own life. You know, maybe we should take a step back and just keep this relationship professional. And inevitably, this backfires. I need her to spin something for me. Well, that's too bad because I think she quit. What do you need her to spin? Murder. Lucy addresses the obstacle of her inexperience by lying. Well, I've only got one left, candy makers. Oh, that's it. That's our specialty. Your candy maker? Oh, yes. We, we've we made a lot of... Oh, candy. good. Lucy is prone to biting off more than she can chew. She gets herself into situations where she can repeatedly fail in the most playful and charming ways. <laughs> After a series of obstacles and attempts to overcome the obstacles which result in new obstacles, etc., we get to about two to five minutes away from the end of the show. It's now time for the protagonist's final shot at their goal, or their final attempt to fix the problems that they created while pursuing their goal. It's generally going to be a point of no return that determines for good whether they're going to get what they want in the episode. I do have one emergency solution that I can use that'll kind of put everything back to normal, relatively speaking. I need Jesse. Well, she quit. Then you better get her back. I got news for you. If we're making this movie, we gotta get a table immediately. All right, look it. Let's stop fooling around. Let's just slip him some money. All right, girls. Now, this is your last chance. If one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Now we're down to the last three minutes of the show. It's here that we find out whether they failed or succeeded at their short-term goal. Here, you did it. You figured out that crazy solution like you always do. Whatever Rick did seemed to work. Well, kind of. Michael fails to get the publicist back and make his family look good. I saw him today, he's fine with us. Wait, what, you saw him today? Yeah, I told him he was getting in the way of your happiness. You did, you said that to my son. It looks like not even bribery will get Jerry and company a table. Here, take this, I'm starving. Take it, take it. <laughs> Uh, Denison Fall! And it looks like Lucy and Ethel will never hack it in the job world. I think we're fighting a losing game! And now, just a minute from the end of the show, we see how this success or failure will affect the protagonist in the long term. Usually, this is a chance to show how everything goes back to normal, so that the next episode can start with a blank slate. Michael fails to achieve his short term goal of getting his son into the Milford School. Well, it looks like you won't be getting into this school. Are you disappointed? Well, are you disappointed? But he may have taken a step towards understanding his son better. Jerry reaffirms his normal life as an inconsequential New York City stand-up. Why don't you two just go to the movies by yourself? I'm not in the mood. So you're not going? You don't need us. Well, I can't go to a bad movie by myself. What, am I gonna make sarcastic remarks to strangers? <laughs> Ethel and Lucy fail at their jobs, but they win their husbands' respect. Because while they were failing at their jobs, their husbands were failing at housework. Let's say we go back to the way we were. Huh? We will make the money and you spend it. Oh, that's yeah, great with me. Oh, yeah. And, and listen, girls, we never realized how tough it was to run a house before. Uh. <laughs> so just to show you our appreciation, we brought you a little present. Really? I did. For each one of you, a five-pound box of chocolate. Oh. <laughs>
And the Rick and Morty episode ends with a montage showing how killing an alternate timeline version of himself will probably scar Morty forever. So on the one hand, since they're in an alternate universe where Rick didn't destroy humanity, everything is kind of back to normal. But on the other hand, the show will from now on take place in an alternate universe. And Morty killed himself. Kind of. So let's review. 1. Introduce the protagonist's main goal. 2. Introduce the main obstacle to that goal. 3. The protagonist comes up with a plan to overcome the obstacle. 4. Now we're about 5 minutes into the show. From here until about 15 minutes in, we have a series of scenes where the protagonist tries to overcome an obstacle, which then gets replaced with another obstacle. 5. The protagonist gives their goal, or fixing the obstacles, a final shot. 6. Success or failure. 7. We find out how this affects them in the long term, and usually everything goes back to normal. Now, many sitcoms have more than one protagonist, or multiple supporting characters whose stories we also follow in between the scenes where we follow the stories of the protagonist. These are called B or C plots, and they follow the same formula in the same order. They just don't get as much airtime and don't always need to be resolved. So there you go. All sitcoms are now ruined until you pay attention to how each sitcom uniquely plays within this structure. It's this formula that gave Lucille Ball the freedom to be a complete goofball within each individual scene, that let Seinfeld spin entire stories and cultural phenomena out of the smallest observations for nine years, and provided the skeleton for Arrested Development's many intertwining character threads and recurring but constantly developing in-jokes, and Rick and Morty's self-referential use of the sitcom format as a way to comment on the meaninglessness of human existence. It's strange to think that network sitcoms like Friends or Two and a Half Men share a formula with Arrested Development, or Broad City, Veep, Kimmy Schmidt, It's Always Sunny, Bojack Horseman, and so on. But that's proof that what makes a sitcom unique or different is not whether it follows this formula, but how it follows it. Heck, this formula even worked for some highly acclaimed dramas. You're goddamn right.